Pulling back now and just thinking about um, the current issues in um, executive reward, um, not only domestically, but also um, you as someone that, as I said at uh, the top, have worked for a raft of multinational organisations. So thinking internationally, um, what, what are, what are the, we, we've, I know, talked about some of the issues, but could you just talk about executive reward um, uh, issues nationally, internationally, including the interplay between rewarding people at the top leading organizations and those people elsewhere. Um, we, we, there's a lot of debate about pay equity. There's a lot uh, that's talking about um, pay ratios reporting as part of transparency. Um, maybe that's one of many issues that are currently on the table. But again, could you reflect on um, where, where we stand there, please? Yeah, I guess in, in the kind of UK PLC environment, one of the, um, I guess, interesting observations is more and more UK boards being willing to raise um, CEO pay to rival US pay. Um, so that's been a, a kind of, I think, a, a particular bone of contention of a perception, at least, of, of US executives being paid considerably more than UK. And... Um, that has been a constraint in terms of organizations being able to attract the right talent. So particularly if it might be, for example, a UK listed company, but the operations are in the US, the likelihood is that the, the chief executive is going to be a, a US um, person. And so actually being able to attract the right talent has been, um, I think, something which companies have expressed concern with. And I haven't read it in detail yet, but I believe the Investment Association just yesterday published their the revised principles of remuneration, which is kind of time to tackle this sort of issue in terms of trying to give companies a little bit more flexibility if they have the right business case, and have the right justification behind it in order to say, these are the peers that we are benchmarking against. This is why we believe we need to increase the quantum in order to remain competitive. And I think the door is kind of shifting open a little bit, which I think for many years it hasn't been. Um, I think that's partly bowing to a little bit of, of that kind of observation pressure from some of the, the, the big players. Um, I think the whole issue, as you rightly mentioned, around you know, sort of fair pay, equal pay, the EU pay transparency directive, which come into play um, 2026, I believe, is absolutely focusing people's minds. I think generally there is acceptance that this is a good thing in terms of you know increasing employee engagement, in terms of dialing up the... ESG and the diversity and inclusion strategy agendas, which many companies have been um, really focusing on in recent years, but actually getting their heads around what do they practically need to do is really what's grabbing a lot of companies' attention at the moment. So we're really thinking about what's the understanding of the impact of it, where is their business readiness, and what is their plan in terms of actually getting ready for the new directive requirements for things like disclosure, et cetera, and reporting requirements that may come into play. Um, so that's also been on the plate as well as really, I think, probably as emergence from COVID, a real focus I've seen more and more around employee well-being um, and seeing that as a source of competitive advantage, seeing that as really a source of how does that reinforce the employer brand um, and much more personalised support in terms of moments that matter as well as the whole area of work changing through more hybrid working, remote working through, again, COVID forcing that as a, an area of, of focus is, again, something I've seen. And in the UK specifically, probably a, a heightened or more interesting focus around skills-based pay. Um, so particularly the Labour government seem to be, or new Labour government seem to be really focusing on skills as a priority. Many organisations are experiencing skills gaps. And so thinking about how they're actually progressing pay, for example, through skills um, is, again, on the radar of, of many organisations. So I'd say those are probably the main ones that I'm I'm observing. Executive pay, I would say, is more around content um, and comparison to US peers. Uh, That's really interesting. Yes, so quantum um, issues around equity, um, issues linked to skills more generally, um, thinking about uh, a domestic policy agenda, um, a, a lot of uh, interesting issues to tackle there. And of course, one of the other unique things about executive remuneration, of course, is that it combines corporate governance with 
the practical practicalities of the, you know this aspect of people management um yeah. we've got effective from the beginning of january 2025 um, uh, an updated corporate governance code uh, over the course of your 30 years you've certainly seen uh, pretty much from the formation um the cadbury uh, intervention that started it all off, which of course has had a huge influence, not just in the UK, but around the world. Um, this thing has grown um, exponentially over the years. Um, any observations following the round of consultations that took place on this revised code um, during 2022-23, um, what are your thoughts on um, any significant changes as far as uh, reward management is concerned um, that people need to think about beginning from uh, um, January 2025? Yeah, so I would say it's probably not significant changes from my observation. I mean, the, the code in itself you know, isn't law, um, but it does make a lot of sense in terms of how companies should be directed. And, and it really works on the basis of a comply or explain type principle. And um, so it's it in many cases just saying, you know, these are the kind of core principles that you need to really adopt. So that could include things like ensure that what you're ever doing in reward is linked to your strategy, as well as the um, provisions such as you know, the board needs to establish a remuneration committee. So they all make a lot of really, really good sense. And I think in terms of the um, um, changes that were taken effect from January 2025, they're not so material. They include things like getting better disclosure around malice and clawback provisions, for example, which is really around how you're ensuring that you can either stop a, a bonus payment being made or call back a bonus payment if there's inappropriate behaviours in play. Um, but I think a few tweaks really around en enhancing transparency in pay as well uh, are coming into play. But all of it really, I think most organisations operating in the FTSE would be I would think doing a lot of this stuff already and it's really just reinforcing what makes sense, what is good practice, um, what should they be thinking of in terms of directing, managing their business effectively. Um, so, yeah, no, nothing massively different, um, but I think building on, on what we have already. And the fact that we've had 32 going on 33 years of comply or explain, I mean, that was at the core of what Cadbury brought in after the corporate scandals that led to that committee being set up. Um, you, as you say, that's something still absolutely central. Um, there's been some criticism that, frankly, people have not been willing to do the explanation bit not being willing to take the, the bold actions that would really align um, executive reward with strategy. Um, do, do you think with greater encouragement that organisations may be prepared to think a little bit more strategically about, OK, we don't necessarily always comply. We're not just, just box tickers, but, yeah. but we've got a story to tell. What, what, what's, what's the impact there on executive reward um, professionals? You know, I think... Um... If I, did, I did some research with a purposeful company a few a couple of years ago, which was kind of looking at the whole area of deferred shares, which is particularly restricted shares as opposed to performance related shares, and looking at some of the obstacles in play as to why there, there wasn't more prevalent practice of that in the FTSE 100. And some of the feedback I was hearing from companies was, look, we don't necessarily want to put our head above the parapet well, because the amount of engagement that would be required to do something different than what is, I guess, accepted as the norm is enormous and would require rounds and rounds of consultation. And again, this will also depend on the kind of profile of the shareholder base, et cetera, in terms of how receptive they would be. So I would love to see actually a lot more creativity and differentiation but the reality is, at the moment, if you pick up any REM report of a FTSE 100, they're going to be broadly similar. I think the Investment Association is kind of opening the door a little bit in terms of the um, guidance which they're now issuing. Um, but in essence, it's very much a similar approach. And I think it is down to that emphasis of needing to really, really engage with who your shareholders are, bearing in mind there will then be a, a shareholder binding vote on your policy and if you don't get the policy past the line it can't be legally implemented um, so i'd love to see more engagement i think part of it is around also investors being willing to have those conversations um, and ensure that there is then meaningful dialogue to encourage change and will be more different practices coming into the forefront of course you don't have that same scrutiny when you're below the board so companies do have much more freedom 
Um, and again, in, this, in the research I did, um, you sometimes found that the top executives and not with the executive directors would be, for example, subject to performance-related LTIP, whereas other employees below would be subject more to restricted shares, for example, where there was a, an LTIP eligibility because they had the freedom to do that. Um, but just an observation, I think it's really around that, that kind of engagement being required if you're going to do something very different. Yes, indeed. So as you say, a huge investment, not uh, just in the actual uh, cost um, of the reward itself, but in the whole process of uh, getting it through um, the institutional and uh, corporate governance um, framework. One can understand uh, sometimes some uh, reluctance, resistance there. Um, ju just before we uh, come to uh, a conclusion, what certainly been a very interesting conversation, thank you for it, um, the remuneration group. Um, I, I don't know how much you're uh, in a position just to share with us your vision, um, having uh, taken on the role as chair of what is obviously a very um, important um, and interesting uh, gathering of FTSE 100 reward directors. Um, what, 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 uh, as I say, what, what do you see as your vision um, over the coming few years for uh, that group and the kinds of things that it can do, bearing in mind the backlog that we've just been describing? Um, no, well, just for, for background, the remuneration group has been going for over 20 years. Um, when I was in the top reward seat in FTSE 50 multinationals, I was a member over probably a 15 year period. And I think what really makes it stand out to maybe other networking groups is the fact it's member led. Um, and it's not you know, part of a big corporation, it's also not for profit. So you, you kind of have a different approach and mindset where it's not kind of what can you give me to the group, it's what can I contribute to the group, I think is what I see from members. And a really kind of safe space where we talked a little bit earlier around the role of navigating multiple stakeholders, and that can be quite lonely. So actually having this sort of peer network um, enables you to have a safe space where people have your back but you can have, again, quite quite robust conversations or quite challenging conversations. But at the end of the day, everyone's there being mutually supportive with a view of how can we really kind of support and help each other. Um, I think one of the interesting aspects of the group is also the, um, the peer networking, um, so the sort of peer um, support. Um, so particularly for maybe newly appointed um, heads of reward, and having an opportunity to speak to somebody who's kind of seasoned, who's been there, seen it, done it, is incredibly valuable. And there's also a reward leadership program, which has been developed um, actually in partnership with Willis Towers Watson, and is about helping to develop the next generation of reward leaders. And so TRG members will actually help facilitate sessions um, on this program, giving their own personal experience, giving their perspectives. And I think that kind of combination of really um, building capabilities of reward leaders in this safe space, as well as thinking about how we can support the development of future reward leaders is a key area that I'd like to see really focus on going forward, as well as bringing in you know, great guest speakers. Um, we've had Duncan Brown recently talking about skills-based pay, um, for example, to really kind of challenge assumptions, to kind of introduce new thoughts, to kind of share maybe academic evidence on areas of opportunity, et cetera, really to ensure that what we're doing is developing and building capabilities in reward, which again will help people in their own, own personal development as well as in the companies that they're supporting. So uh, exciting opportunities ahead in the, the TRG. Well, I'm sure they uh, are very fortunate in uh, having you um, at the helm, um, having been very much actively inside it um, and now being able to uh, um, champion and spearheading it going forward. And yes, I, I, I saw with great interest um, the Reward Leadership Programme um, run with Willis Tyers uh, Watson. Um, makes you think that's another area where we were talking earlier about the combination of people in the management consultancy space and those inside organisations actively collaborating rather than feeling that, you know, they need to sit in separate silos. Sure, when true independence is needed, of course, um, that, that can be ring fence, but ultimately it's doing what's right for the business um, and to be able to justify uh, what it is that uh, then is being determined. And so it sounds like a very interesting partnership. Um, I, I guess the inevitable then is, um, so here we are, we have the benefit of your three decades 
Um, all those things that you're involved in, obviously you talk to uh, MBA students as well as specialists through the CIPD, um, you're, you're now chairing this hugely influential group. Thinking about the aspirant reward professionals, the people who are reading um, our textbook, who are studying um, on a CIPD or similar accredited programme, um, stepping back then and <laughs> projecting for people who may be looking to the next 30 years, are, are, are there some key points that you might share with them that they could usefully reflect on, um, you know, in, in, in that lonely world of being somebody uh, entering the portal, uh, perhaps for the first time? I think it's really about joining the dots, um, if I can put it that way. So I think you can learn the theory of reward. You know, you can design an analytical job evaluation scheme. You can look at pay structures, pay setting, etc. But it's really around how are you applying it in your business. And I think that's about really being inquisitive, asking questions about how your organisation is run, um, what are the behaviours, what's the future of world look like, work look like in your organisation, what are the skills that you're going to need to bring in, what's the behaviours that you want to dial up, what are the results that you want to reward, etc. And ensuring that what you're doing is, is then relevant to the, the business needs. And I think it's also about um, saying don't accept um, a request to do something without challenging what is the problem I'm looking to solve here. So, so often I've seen examples of, oh, we need to do the next shiny thing because that's what other companies are doing, but actually it may not be the best or the only solution to implement that. So I would say, what is the problem you're looking to solve? And then when you are looking at articulating an issue or challenge to solve, start with writing a project charter. It might sound quite simple, but a very simple one page setting out what are the expectations are, what are the deliverables, what are the risks, what's the timeline is incredibly helpful because so often, again, I've seen projects where people assume, oh, I thought we are going to do this, or I expected that was going to be the outcome, or I'm not sure how much involvement is going to be required, etc. So really, kind of really setting the expectations, the boundaries at the outset is, is really important. And a simple one page charter is worth investing time in doing that. As well as really thinking, do you have the right sponsorship and, and do you have the right capacity and do you have the right capabilities? So, for example, if you are thinking about a new performance management system, are you sure that line managers have the capabilities to have the performance conversations? Or actually, before you, you launch and you might have designed a wonderful performance management system, maybe there's an approach which is required to build capabilities, for example, in ensuring consistency and fairness in how performance conversations are handled, how smart objectives are set, etc. So thinking about it holistically and lining up what you're doing in reward of what your business needs are and really being great storytellers. So I think great reward professionals um, have a clear narrative explaining what they're doing and how that links with the business needs. I think that's where you build trust, you build engagement and you build buy into whatever you're looking to achieve. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, make new friends. So in different facets of the business, whether that's finance, investor relations, strategy, or they may not even be departments, but people will have those sorts of roles. And I would also suggest building what I called an advisory group of representatives from each of those different functions and meet with them periodically. It could be once a quarter, for example, because they will have an ear to the ground, they'll be able to say to you what's going on in reward, and also be great advocates whenever you're rolling out new programs. So think about how you're engaging with others, meeting business needs, starting with project charter, um, telling a great story, I think would be my, my top tips. Wonderful um, tips. Uh, you, you've beautifully combined the profound with the practical. Um, and you need both. And uh, that, that really says it all. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that. Is there anything that I haven't asked you to talk about that you think maybe I should have? No, I, I don't think so. I think we've had a very comprehensive discussion there. Well, it's very kind of you, as I say once again, to uh, give up your valuable time. Uh, thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome, Stephen.